Alrighty, 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 alrighty then, alrighty, alrighty, alrighty. Can, how many times can I say it before it gets way too annoying? You already found that? You already found that? That is awesome. Look at that. Just, just absolutely shredded. Afterward. Thank you. Whew. Is that hot in here? No. No? You guys are comfortable? Okay. If you're comfortable, let's stay. What? Fan myself? All right. Cool. <clears throat> All right. I've got some things to share with you guys. Naturally. Boom. Okay. What's our series called? Dynasty. Dynasty. Why is it called Dynasty? Why is it Dynasty? Yes, God was setting up his path, I like that word, path, or his dynasty through which the Messiah is going to come. Jesus is coming, not for several hundred years later, but still, Jesus is going to come, and he's going to come through the line of da Laney, hi, how are you? Not the line of Laney, but the line of David. We're glad you're here even if you are late, and you've got Hardee's. Hardee's is one of my favorite fast food places. I'm just saying. Seriously, their burgers are like mass. Anyway. Before we get on. Okay, so God, in the book of 1 Samuel, God begins to set up his dynasty through which Jesus the Messiah is coming. You guys know that all of Scripture, Old and New Testament, is all about Jesus. Did you know that? Even though Jesus is not present in bodily form in the Old Testament, the Old Testament is still about him. We're going to see a little bit of that tonight. But, <clears throat> um, so, what is the applicational question that I'm asking you guys? You guys remember the applicational question? Oh, kind of. I worded it differently. Was that only for last week? Maybe that was only for last week, yeah. Are you talking about the Lord's thing? No. It, I'll give you, who's? Who's your king? Boom. Who's your king? That's the applicational question we're asking through this whole series. Who's your king? You have one of two options. What are they? Yourself or God. That's right. We're either going to bow the knee to king or queen self, and I'm going to do what I want to do in my, with my life. I'm going to do, how, do it how I want to do it, and I'm not going to listen to anybody or anything except me, or I'm going to bow to God. Those are really the only two options. You say, yeah, but what if we choose to follow some other religion and we bow to that religion? Well, really, that's you choosing to do that rather than to bow to God. So really, it's still just bowing to yourself. Make sense? Moving on. Good. All right. Boom. Who memorized Colossians 3.17 from last week? Go Hallel. In whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Awesome. Excellent. Trent, did you memorize it? No? You forgot it? That's okay. Matthew, you over there since you weren't here last week. Did you memorize it? <laughs> I'm just teasing you. Very good, Hallel. Very good. Good, good working on that. Work on the scripture verses because they are tools. They are instruments to help you in this world. Awesome. Good stuff. All right. Let's get to our pass. Oh, wait. Before we get to our passage, what happened last week? And? I did those last week. Excellent. Absolutely. And so the whole, the whole lesson we learned from that is we... Give our heart's desires to God. Does that mean they're always going to come true? No. No. But we're seeking God for his glory and his will and not pursuing our own. And that's one way to bow to Jesus as king. And that's myself. Okay. So let's get to chapter 2. 1 Samuel chapter 2. If you have a Bible, open it there. If you want to follow along in your notes, the scripture is there too. We're going to begin in verse 11. Now verses 1 through 10 are really, really cool. It's a song of praise that Hannah sings to God after she drops Samuel off at the temple to live with Eli and to serve him. And it's a really, really cool song and it's really, really precious. But we're not going to cover that. So go back and read that on your own. It's really, really cool. Go back and read that on your own. We're going to start in verse 11 after Hannah's song. Verse 11 says, Then Elkanah, who was who? Who was Elkanah? Her husband. Also, it's Samuel's dad. Dad, father. Yes, now you're good. Okay. Elkanah went home to Ramah. And the boy was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli the priest. All right, so now we know we kind of get a snapshot of what's going on. Verse 12, 
Enter the villains. Dun, dun, dun. Here we go. Now, the sons of Eli were worthless men. How would you like to be said of you? You are completely worth... Boy, that, that would be harsh. The sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know the Lord. The custom of the priests with the people was that when any man offered a sacrifice, the priest's servant would come while the meat was boiling with a three-pronged fork in his hand. He would thrust it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot, and all, the for, all that the fork brought up, the priest would take for himself. This is what they did at Shiloh to all the Israelites who came there. Moreover, before the fat was burned, the priest's servant would come and say to the men who were sacrificing, Give meat for the priest to roast, for he will not accept boiled meat from you, but only raw. And if the man said to him, Let them burn the fat first, and then take as much as you wish, they would say, No, you must give it now, or if, and if not, I will take it by force. Thus the sin of the young men was very great in the sight of the Lord, for the men treated the offering of the Lord with contempt. Now, how many of you are sitting there scratching your head going, what in the world is this talking about? One, two, a couple of you. Okay, does anybody have any idea what's going on here? They're disrespecting God by not taking their job seriously. Yeah, that's part of it. That's part of it. They are definitely disrespecting. What they're doing is they're disrespecting the sacrificial system. Now, think back with me, okay? Turn your brains on. I know you've been to school all day. You're like, I'm tired of thinking. But turn your brains on with me. Go back to Moses. God gave Moses the five books of the law. Who can name them? Genesis. Oh, wait. Five books of law are Genesis. Thank you. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And within that law, God set up the sacrificial system. You guys might remember in the Old Testament, they would sacrifice a bull or a ram or a goat or something else for a sin offering. And they would burn it on an altar. They would do all kinds of things. And in God's law, he wrote out, this is how you're to do the sacrifice. This is the meat that the priest is going to be kept. Because God did allow the priest to keep certain meats. He allowed the priestly line, which was the Levitical line, the Levites, they had certain meats that they were allowed to keep because the Levites, the tribe of Levi, they, did not, they were not given land. They were given the responsibility to care for God's temple or God's tabernacle or you, know, you can use the word church to kind of give you an idea. They, that was their job to care for that. And the rest of the tribes of Israel, they got land so they could farm, but the Levites couldn't farm. So God provided for the Levites by allowing them to have certain meats from the sacrifice. Does that make sense? Kind of, sort of, maybe, clear as mud. Here's the thing. They were abusing this law. Deuteronomy 18.3 says... And this shall be the priest's due from the people for those offering a sacrifice, whether an ox or sheep. They shall give to the priest the shoulder and the two cheeks and the stomach. What were the priests supposed to get? Shoulder, cheeks, and stomach. What kind of cheeks? Do you really think there's much meat here? What kind of, thing, what kind of cheeks? My cheeks. Yeah, rump roast. Okay. <laughs> shoulder and the cheeks and the stomach. That was to go to the priest. But... What Eli's sons were doing, Hophni and Phinehas, they were taking whatever meat they wanted. They would, the, the people would come and they would boil the meat. What they were supposed to do is they were supposed to burn off all the fat because that was the offering to God and that no one was supposed to eat the fat from the meat. But the priests would come and they wanted it raw, first of all, and they would dip their forks in cauldron. Now, I have a cauldron. Everybody needs to grab a fork. Quickly, quickly, quickly. Uh, I'm trying. Quickly. I'm trying. <laughs> yeah, 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 you can break off a time because they're three yeah. No, you don't, no, no, no. I can just see that ending up in the marshmallows. Okay, so then, they'd be boiling the meat to getting it ready for the sacrifice and everything, and the priest would come up and they'd say, they would stick the fork in, and whatever came out belonged to them. You get one. Oh, well, she tried to get two, but it didn't work. That'd be funny if it came up with nothing. They'd get nothing. I don't think that would work. Oh, oh he was going to stop, stop, stop. Three, three, oh, she got two. Oh, Adam got three. That's cheating. That is not cheating. It is on the fork. <laughs> oh, man. I uh, all right. Oh, man. Okay. So, whatever the fork pulled out... That's the meat they would keep. Question. What meat were they supposed to take for the... For the, the shoulder, the butt cheeks, and the stomach. 
Yes. But they were abusing the sacrificial system this way. And that was their sin. Abusing it. They were taking whatever meat they wanted when they wanted it. Yes, you may eat them, please. That's a fresh bag of marshmallows. I bought it today. It's safe. I even washed out that bowl for you guys before I poured them in there. All right, back to the scriptures. Back to the scriptures. Okay. Samuel chapter 2. Verse 18. So now you know, guys, what's going on and why it was so bad what they were doing. Can we have more? Later. (laughs) All right, all right, all right. All right, all right. Verse 18. Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy clothed in a linen ephod, and I love this part. His mother used to make for him a little robe and take it to him each year when she went up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. You guys remember, they went up once a year to offer that sacrifice. So every year that his mom came back, she went to visit her son. That makes sense to me. Verse 20. Then Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife and say, <clears throat> May the Lord give you children by this woman for the petition she asked of the Lord. So, she, so they returned home. What I love about this is that we see that Hannah, even though she gave up her son willingly, she still loves him. Was that ever a question in anyone's mind? She still loves him, and she brought him clothes every year and probably had to make the robe longer and the sleeves longer as she came back year over year because kids had this weird habit of growing. So every year she would bring him something to wear because I'm about sure by the time she gets here, he's like, Mom, you better grab me something now or my butt's going to be flapping in the wind because I'm getting so tall, this robe isn't covering me anymore. And Eli would bless... Now, I love this that says about Eli would bless Elkanah and Hannah. It makes me think that Eli really liked Samuel. That, that maybe Samuel was doing his work, he was doing his job, and Eli really liked him. And so he said this blessing. And look at verse 21. Indeed, the Lord visited Hannah, and she conceived and bore three sons and two daughters. And the boy Samuel grew in the presence of the Lord. That's just kind of cool. And that's, and that's about the last time we hear about Hannah. She went on. God gave her the desires of her heart because of her faithfulness to him. And that's a really, really cool picture. I love that. Verse 22. Now, Eli was very old, and he kept hearing all his sons were doing. Were they doing good? No. Okay. He kept hearing all that they were doing to Israel and how they lay with the women who were serving at the entrance to the tent of meeting. What does that mean? They were sleeping around. Absolutely. The women, plural, gives you an idea. They weren't monogamous. That's a big word. What does that mean? One wife. They didn't stick to one gal. They, they slept around. Good or bad? Bad. Bad. Thank you very much. 23. And he said, this is back to Eli. He said to them, why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil dealings from all these people. No, my sons. Everybody go, no, my sons. No, my yeah. sons. It is no good report that I hear the people of the Lord spreading abroad. If someone sins against a man, God will mediate for him. But if someone sins against the Lord, who can intercede for him? But they would not listen to the voice of their father, for it was the will of the Lord to put them to death. Now, let me tell you what's going on here. They're sinning by their, they're stealing meat. They're, they're taking what they want. They're not letting the fat cook off. So, that, so they're... They're um, abusing the sacrificial system, and they're sleeping around. So these guys, as it says in the very beginning of this paragraph, are worthless men. They're horrible people. They're people that you and I would not want to be our priest. These guys are priests. Think about it. Think about it. If I was doing horrible things like this, would you guys want to be a part of my youth group? No. Absolutely not. You'd be like, get that guy away from me. He is weird. That's the way these guys are. You're a good weird. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And Eli hears of everything they're doing. And guess what? According to the law, they should have been stoned. Adultery was a, a, an offense for which you were stoned. And what did Eli do? Hold out your hand. Bad boy. That's about all the punishment he gave them. Um, this kind of like Americans, most Americans are like this now. In a lot of ways. Very selfish. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Very, <laughs> very, very selfish. Absolutely. And Eli did nothing about it except mildly rebuke them. And it said that they didn't even listen to them. And their punishment should have been stoned. So it says that it was the will of the Lord to put them to death. So God was going to take care of their punishment. That's a scary thing, by the way. Verse 26. Now the boy Samuel continued to grow both in stature and in favor with the Lord and also with man. Now here's our key verse, and let me tell you why. 
Because amidst all of this negative, evil, sinful influence, Samuel remained faithful to the Lord. We're going to come back to that. Let's finish the story. I want to come back to that. Okay, verse verse 27. And there came a man from God, Eli, and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Did I indeed reveal myself to the house of your father when they were in Egypt, subject to the house of Pharaoh? Did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest to go up to my altar and burn incense to wear an ephod before me? I gave to the house of your father all my offerings by fire from the people of Israel. Why then do you scorn my sacrifices and my offerings by fire... Uh, offerings that I command, commanded for my dwelling and honor your sons above me by fattening yourself on the choicest parts of every offering of my people. Okay, basically, that's a lot of words. What he's saying is there is he's asking some rhetorical questions. That's ret- rhetorical means obvious answers. God's saying, did I bring you guys up out of Egypt? Obvious answer? Yes. Okay. Did I anoint the Levites to be the priests of my people? Yes. Yes. So I did all that. So then why are you letting your sons screw around with my sacrificial system? Why are you letting them mess this thing up? God is accusing him through this prophet, that, this man of God that came to Eli. Verse 30. Therefore the God of Israel declares, I promised that your house, would be, that your house and the house of your father should go on in and out before me forever. But now the Lord declares, Far be it from me, for those who honor me I will honor, and those who despise me I shall lightly esteem. Behold, the days are coming when I will cut off your strength and the strength of your father's house, so there will not be an old man in your house. Basically, because you have acted this way, I'm going to cut off your strength. There's not going to be an old person in your house. Your family is going to die young. Ouch. Ouch. Go to verse 34. And this, that shall come upon you, your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, shall be the sign to you. Both of them shall die on the same day. Now, no parent ever wants to bury their kids. It should always be the other way around. But in this case, God's saying to Eli, because you have failed to raise good sons and you have been worthless both of your sons are going to die on the same day. That would be like tragic news to me if I heard that. That would, that would like kill me right there. Verse 35. And I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who shall do according to what is in my heart and in my mind. And I will build him a sure house and he shall go in and out before my anointed forever. That's pretty strong. Pretty strong what God is telling Eli there. Hey, you've messed up. You're going to pay for it. Your sons are going to pay for it. And I'm going to raise up a priest who's going to do what I want him to do. All right, so what is our key verse? Verse 26. Now the boy Samuel continued to grow in both strength and stature and in favor with the Lord and also with man. Think about this. Samuel got dropped off at Eli's house or the temple, the, uh, the place where they worshipped at a very young age. They estimate four years old, five years old, six years old, somewhere around that, that age time. It would have been very easy for him to look at Eli, look at Eli's sons, and just follow along the, with the crowd. They're going to behave that way. Think back to when you were young. I mean, young, young. Was there ever a person or some people in your life that you, maybe they were teenagers or in their 20s or something, and you looked up to them and you thought, they were just so cool. Like maybe a babysitter or older people in your church or in your neighborhood or something, and you're just like, man. I had that in my life. I looked up at some guys who were teenagers. They were riding skateboards. Like, they were just so cool. How easy would it have been just to follow in their footsteps? Here you've got Hophni and Phinehas, the sons of Eli, worthless men. Here you've got Samuel, a little boy, impressionable boy. How easy would it have been for him to, him to just follow what they did? They get to sleep around. They get to eat whatever meat they want. That's cool. I want to do that. But he didn't. With the negative influences in his life, he still chose to follow the Lord. So I got a question for you. Your key question. Boom. What, and just answer this in your head. What are the bad influences in your life and how are you responding to them? What are the bad, the negative, the sinful influences? What people in your life would it be easy to follow? And what are you doing about it? What celebrities do you absolutely adore? It would be easy to follow the way they live their life. And what are you doing about it? Are you following? Or are you living for the Lord? And that's what I want to challenge you guys to. Key statement. You can write this one down. If I am to make Jesus my king, I must ignore bad 
influences. If I'm going to make Jesus my king, I must ignore bad influences. Question, how many options do we have to who is your king? Two. Two. Yourself or God. You've got these negative, and everybody has them. You've got negative influences in your school, in your neighborhood. Sometimes, I hate to say it, in your own family. Yep. Yeah. And it's hard. Sometimes immediate family, sometimes um, extended family. You've got negative influences. What are you going to do? Who are you going to follow? Who's going to be your king? If you want Jesus to be your king, and if you really want that, I want to surrender G to Jesus as my king, you've got to ignore these negative influences. These negative influences want to pull you away from God and pull you down. You've got to ignore them. Just like Samuel did, to live for the Lord. Let's talk about that more in Breakout. Let's go.